Hi, welcome once again. I'm Imran Garda and you're in the stream. Today, a show you, our community, requested. A look at Native American land losses and what it means for the future of tribal cultures. Joining us today on The Orange Couch is longtime Native American activist Russell Means. Some of you may recognize him from uh, his various acting roles in film and television. But as an activist, he was the founding director of the American Indian Movement, leading several occupation protests in the 1970s, which called on the U.S. government to change its policies towards Native Americans. Uh, Russell, looking forward to, to talking to you, to listening to your thoughts, to picking uh, your brain. You know, today's Thanksgiving, over 300 million Americans are celebrating this day, which deals with the very foundation of their country. You are not. And tell us why. Well, we have always referred to this as thanks taking because of the lies of the American government from day one. The reason for the revolution, the American revolution against the King of England, was because they wanted to expand the 13 colonies, the original 13 colonies. See, the King of England had made a treaty with the Indian people uh, west of the uh, Allegheny Mountains, Appalachian Mountains that there would be no further expansion in order for Washington, General George Washington, to expand his landholders' holdings because he was the largest landowner in colonial America. Mm -hmm. He wanted to go beyond the Appalachians, the mountains, the Green Mountains, the Blue Mountains. And in order to do that, he had to violate the orders of the king. So the only recourse for the landed gentry of the colonial empire was to revolt against the King of England. It had nothing to do with the Stamp Act. It had nothing to do with taxation without representation. It had everything to do with the land grab. Mm -hmm. Well, looking forward to your thoughts as we expand the discussion, excuse uh, the pun, and look at the various avenues uh, to explore Thanksgiving and Native American uh, rights. Once again, welcome to the program. Uh, once again as well, filling in for our digital producer Ahmed Shihabuddin is Latoya Peterson, the editor of Racialicious.com. It's a blog that covers race and culture. Now Latoya has been looking out for all your live feedback. You can still tweet her your comments and questions with the hashtag AJStream. Uh, Latoya, welcome. I know we've got lots of great feedback for Russell Means, but before we get into that, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the other stories that we've been covering. Definitely, Imran. So, uh, as protesters continue to demand an end to military rule in Egypt, members of the media are being arrested and assaulted. Filmmaker Jahan Mujain was detained and her camera confiscated. Our online community particularly asked us to cover this story, and others are already jumping in. Author and activist Naomi Klein tweeted, Courageous filmmaker Jahan Nujem, who made Control Room about Al Jazeera, is still in custody in Egypt. Hashtag free Jahan now. Also, Ash uh, sorry, five, sorry, Ashraf Khalil says, if military keeps arresting people like Mona el Tahawi and Jahan Nujem, they lose the war for international public opinion in days. Egyptian-American journalist Mona el Tahawi says that she was arrested, beaten, and sexually assaulted. Shortly after she was re released, she alleged that five or six surrounded me, groped and prodded my breasts, grabbed my genital area, and I lost count how many hands tried to get into my trousers. Just awful things and we'll continue to cover them. Another story that we've been getting feedback on is in Saudi Arabia, where reports say several people were killed in fighting with security forces in the eastern city of Katif. This tweet from Sweet Arabia says, Saudi police firing pellets at innocent protesters in Katif, but I'm also being told that several are killed, not just two people. And I Extraordinary tweeted, Sunni or Shiite, we're all united for the sake of our country's safety. There wasn't any necessity in killing those people. So those are some of the stories that we're watching and following. If you have any more information about them, tweet us your updates with the hashtag AJStream. So back to you, Imran. Thanks for that. Yes, Latoya. Now, uh, we're talking about Native American issues today, as we mentioned, because those of you in our online community had voted for the story on our Reddit page. And this is it. You can continue to tell us what you want us to cover. Just visit our Reddit page at ajstream.reddit.com. And we're posting new updates there every single day. My name is Natalie. Uh, I'm in Tahrir Square right now. I'm in the stream. 
In the United States, Thanksgiving Day is often portrayed as an event back in the 1620s when English, uh, when English colonists held a feast to thank their Native American allies for helping them start new lives in America. But from the perspective of many Native Americans, the holiday symbolizes centuries of land seizure and the erosion of tribal cultures in the United States. Of course, as the U.S. expanded its territory, the government had allotted land for Native American tribes. To understand the scale of their land losses, let me show you this video over here. It's from uh, Sam Hilliard from uh, Louisiana State University. It's fascinating. You'll see the land in green is what was traditionally uh, Native American land, American Indian land. Say, look at that, 1810, 20, 30, and the green just keeps diminishing, white increasing, uh, eating up the pie of land. Now today, more than 65% of those tribal reservation lands are now in the hands of non-Native Americans. The question is, how did this happen? And additionally, what does this mean for the future of a people. Well, as we introduced him, Russell Means is, is here. We're going to discuss this. I mean, there's, there's so many big questions here that can't be properly addressed in 25 minutes, but we're going to try our best. Um, on Thanksgiving Day, it's an existential question, is it not, for uh, many Americans, because Thanksgiving, the myths surrounding Thanksgiving um, show us that Thanksgiving is about honor and friendship and food and niceties and this kind of harmony of cultures. But the reality is very different from that. The reality is, again, and I can't say it enough, it's the big lie. This country has lied from day one. John Smith, who was a captain, John Smith of the English military, who co-founded Jamestown. When he left Jamestown to go back to England, he first went to Cape Cod area, Connecticut, Massachusetts area, and he spread smallpox and measles filled blankets among the Indian people. Over 90% of the Indian population of that entire area was wiped out. Hence, when the pilgrims came, they in fact built their village, the pilgrim village, on the ashes of the alleged capital of the Indian nation at that time and went on from there with the big lies. The, in fact, they would not allow Indian people into Plymouth Village unless they had business to do with someone inside the village. And then never did they break bread or eat with Indian mm -hmm. people. Not once. In fact, the opposite was the truth. And, and as many Americans are celebrating Thanksgiving, many American Indians are mourning this day. We saw an event last year. There were some cameras uh, sent there. Do you, do you think that's the way to go about it, to show a, a counter-reality, an alternative narrative? No, I'm through with protesting. Uh, I believe that the, uh, if you want to be sovereign, you have to act sovereign. And the United States of America has proven that it's the biggest liar in history, and it's proven by their constitution, which backs up the treaties of the land. So if you expect this country to be just to anyone, hmm. you included, that's the big lie, because they have violated from day one the Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution, okay? Had they lived up to it, we'd still own the land that you showed on that map of yeah. 1840. Yeah. All that land would still be ours, honorably. But no one ever says anything about the majority of Indian people who lived east of the Mississippi. Now, at the coming, at the time of 1500, it's estimated by the white man's own historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, that there are approximately 12 million people, Indian people in the continental United States. In 1500. By 1900, there were 250,000 left. That's over 99% genocide. Mm -hmm. You talk about a Holocaust, that's over 99%. Since that time, in the year 2000, the census has proven there's only still 
only 250,000 full-blooded Indian people in the United States. Zero population growth for the last century. The ongoing genocide of my people is because we happen to still live. That little map, that map right there, holds 40% of the natural resource wealth of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And that's still under our land. And yet, they will not acknowledge that. They have total control. Let's bring Latoya in, dip into some of that uh, incredible, immense feedback that we have for the show. Right. I mean, our readers and our viewers have been just going nuts with uh, trying to talk about and understand this whole land rights issue. Uh, we have a video from Mary Catherine um, to talk a little bit more about where she's trying to find some clarity. In 1923, the Supreme Court said that Indians do not have title to their land, and whenever a white person discovers it, the white person automatically can take it. And this is still good law today. The Supreme Court still cites this case, Johnson v. McIntosh, and the whole reason the Supreme Court uh, decided this case was they said that Indians are racially inferior because they do not farm. So I'm wondering, to Russell Means, what does it mean to be Native American today in America and celebrate Thanksgiving? Again, the big lie. We cannot farm. We have provided the world with 75% of what the world eats today. It was developed through our genealogy, our uh, gene splicing, our inventiveness concerning agriculture. Okay? That's another thing. But I just want to get back to the present holdings. It's held in trust by the federal government. Can you get that word? Just, I mean, how did that, uh, and explain that for, particularly for our global audience, how did that happen? That you had these reservations, that, which were owned by Native Americans, how did it uh, come to be that 65% of the reservations went into the hands of non-natives? They went because the federal government holds the land in trust. We do not own the land. It's held in trust for us because we're incompetent in the white man's world. So consequently, they can do with, with the land what they want. They can give it to a church. They can give it to the Mormons, the Catholics, the Baptists. They can give it to anyone. Casinos. Ranchers, casino casinos builders, yeah. from out of the country. Mm. There are casinos run by people from Singapore and Malaysia. And in this country, on Indian land. So <clears throat> what we have here is a subterfuge of alleged Indian ownership. Why can't they do with the land? You come to my land on the northern plains in, this, in the South Dakota, and you get up on the top hills and you see that beautiful land, you wonder how come we're poor. Hmm. We're poor because it's enforced poverty. We live on 1,500 square miles of land. We have one grocery store for example, hmm. owned by non-Indians. I'm, I'm actually going to show, show a map of that. Uh, and, you know, you, you call it the Republic of Lakota. Yes. Um, and that's in South Dakota. This is it over here uh, in, in yellow. What I found fascinating about Lakota is that, as you mentioned, beautiful land, incredible land. And looking at some of the statistics, um, it's called, you know, officially Pine Ridge Reservation, if you look for it on a, on a map. Uh, the statistics are almost an anomaly compared to the rest of the country, maybe even the region. Um, you, you know, it's like, taking, it's like taking Haiti or Swaziland statistically and plugging it right into the middle of the United States of America with life expectancy, uh, high rates of, uh, low life expectancy, high rates of infant mortality, 97% poverty. How did that come to be? That comes to be because it's a designed genocidal program. That's what Hitler said when he formed the so-called labor camps, the concentration camps for the Jews and the Poles and the gays. When he did that, all apartheid system taken directly from the reservation system of America, both those regimes are gone. And people of the world are, are repaying for the theft and the original theft of those lands, but not in the United States. In fact, the theft goes on. But the Republic of Lakota, we are basing our nonviolent, non-threatening 
reemergence as an independent nation based on the Constitution of the United States of America, and we're going into the international community to verify the legitimacy of, of those treaties as, as valid international mm -hmm. documents. On that note, we had a great comment from Facebook um, from Kavitha Chakru, who asks, how can federal Indian law be changed or amended so that it's more just or fair for tribes? I see you almost spit out that water. Uh, but she does speak about uh, the management of the trust land after the Cobell settlement, which is the policy that created the problems, fractionated land, and the plenary power doctrine. Um, how does this all work together? And how do you think politically um, we can start fixing this really egregious error? First of all, the United States of America absolutely makes up laws, plenary power. Group, you just pick that out of the air. What is plenary power? It means total power over a subject people. That's what it means. Yet they don't define it that way. They'll define it in much more broader terms because we go up against the United States government every year at the UN Commission it used to be on the U.S. Commission on Human Rights. Now it's the Council of Human Rights, okay? Mm -hmm. We go up against them every year with our statistics. And getting back, we have the worst statistics in the world of poverty and, and health in all the world except for eight countries all in Africa. You, t you extrapolate AIDS from that, and we have the worst statistics in the world. We're worse off today than Haiti. The American Indian people in general, I'm not just talking about my Lakota people, I'm talking about the American Indian people in general. Health-wise, we're worse off than Haiti, and poverty-wise. I mean, when you got 97% unemployment, it's, mm. it's atrocious, it's genocidal. The, how, do you, how do you destroy a people? First, you outlaw their spirituality. Then you steal their children. And then you buy... buy uh, Cuisine, by, by the, the misuse of food, you commit genocide. They don't have to shoot us. What they're doing, you know, our life expectancy for a male is 43.9 years. For a female, it's 52 years. So they go to the Commission on Human Rights and they say, oh, they have a life expectancy of 48 years, which is marrying the two extremes. What I'm saying here is they, rather than they give us commodity food, give us commodity food, high in sodium, high in carbohydrates, feeds into sugar diabetes, which engenders heart failure, okay? That's what we die of. Okay. And we don't live long enough to get cancer. Let's uh, get Latoya to dive into some of the video questions that have come through. Right. I mean, speaking of what you just brought up, uh, there's an important question about how this land rights issue also impacts youth, particularly youth that did not grow up uh, on a reservation or around other, na uh, other American Indian adults. Thank you for taking my question on this day of mourning. My name is Kiara Sotile, and I'm from the Karuba tribe. As you've said, millions of acres of reservation land have been taken from Native people. And as a result, lots of Native folks have had to grow up away from their tribal lands. So my question is, how can these Native peoples who've had to grow up away from tribal land still stay connected to their tribes? First of all, every definition of genocide, all four, there's five definitions. Everyone the United States has met in its terms of its relationships with the United, with the American Indian, okay? Relocation, the theft of our children, forcing us into their schools. We cannot educate our own. We can, it's against the law for us to, to teach our language. Mm. No child left behind by Bush cemented that fact, but it's a continuation of the boarding school systems began in the 1800s where you, you destroy the Indian but save the man. That was the, the mantra. Based upon that and all those laws that you talked about earlier in the other uh, tweet talked about, all those laws have to be thrown out. All we have to do is get the United States of America to live up to its own constitution. That's all. And you cannot do it if you're a Democrat or a Republican. As proof in the pudding, you live in, the, you live in this mess. You, you mentioned uh, President George W. Bush's No Child Left Behind education policy. I wonder, what are your thoughts on President Barack Obama? Did you have any hope 
that he might have changed <laughs> things? Hope in the house, Negro. No, thank you. That man, I never thought there'd be a worse president than Bush. And Obama has proven to be worse in every way, in every way. And so consequently, you know, let me give you an example. Instead of billions to Wall Street, why not give $2 million to every American 30 years and over? That would cost less than $300 million. Think of that. Uh, you don't care how they spend it. Hmm. Well, you say, you say instead of billions to Wall Street, which uh, brings me to my next question, there is a lot of anger at economic policy in the states against the banks, against the corporations. Occupy Wall Street, occupy almost every single city out there. Do you sympathize with these movements? Do you support these movements? I sympathize with protests. I sympathize with the Tea Party. I sympathize with the occupiers. I sympathize with everyone that understands that government doesn't work, in, especially in this country, in its present form. Now, this country is founded on the idea of individual liberty, which came from us. Europeans, with all their philosophers, never came across with the concept of individual liberty through representative government. They found that from us, especially on the Eastern Seaboard and specifically from the Iroquois Confederacy, where that young woman that you last read, or we last heard, is from. The Iroquois Confederacy gave that concept. It's recorded in history, and in 1986 or 87, Congress unanimously passed a resolution thanking the Iroquois Confederacy for its input into the Constitution of the United States and the very formation mm. of this country. So <clears throat> what I'm saying to you is that we have to, first of all, stop the government and just make it live up to the, the Constitution. That ensures individual liberty for everyone. Tea Partiers for occupiers, that's where they should join forces is just on the issue of the Constitution, period. Okay, there's a minute and a half left on the program. I want to get Latoya to bring up one more tweet before we go into the post show. Latoya. Right, and it's been fast and furious. People are loving what you're saying. We got a tweet from Singh Alleluia who asks, would you call the Republic of Lakota separatism? And how do you expect the U.S. government to respond to that? <laughs> if at all. <laughs> Asking an American Indian if we believe in separatism. That's about the most ridiculous question I've ever heard. You wouldn't be here if we believed in that. My God, look around you. We understand what neighbors are supposed to be all about. We understand the concept of individual liberty. So therefore, what we have to do is live up to Indian law, which is the Constitution of the United States. Very simple, very simple. And you don't have to worry about these idiots in Congress. I don't care what they call them, Republicans or Democrats. You know, that's the biggest. They're all millionaires, all right? They're all one percenters, every damn one of them. So what the hell, you put them back in. And there should never be another Democrat or Republican ever elected to public office in this entire country. Russell Means, it's been a great pleasure having you on the program. We're going to continue this discussion uh, in the post show on stream.aljazeera.com. I look forward to it, so stay on the couch. And Toya, thanks for joining us again for all our TV viewers who won't see you on the post show. Hope you've uh, enjoyed it. And a reminder on Monday's show, should the internet be legislated? We'll look at the plans that some governments are proposing to control the message online. Uh, stay with us for more Thanksgiving and more Native American rights issues with Russell Means in the post show stream.aljazeera.com. Hope you'll join us there. Bye-bye for now.
Welcome back to the post show on stream.aljazeera.com. As I always say, so much to say, so little time. Russell Means is sampling some of the tweets that are coming through on the tweet wall behind him. And there's been a lot of complimentary stuff and uh, perhaps rightfully so, a passionate, articulate man who's uh, giving us his insight on this Thanksgiving day. Uh, Latoya's keeping her finger on the pulse, not only with the tweets, but the video questions and the Facebook entries. Give us some of that. Oh my gosh, it's so much pouring in. We have from uh, the Liz Mariani. Um, I refuse to celebrate this day. America has amnesia. I'm trying to remember and listen. Then we got another tweet in from uh, Agent Sammy. I don't care about Thanksgiving. I just care about the food, which is probably pretty indicative of what most Americans think. But a really provocative one came in from uh, Cavalierism, who asks, you know, to you directly, Russell, what actions can non-Indigenous activists take in solidarity with Indigenous activists? How do we show support? The Constitution. The Constitution. That's Indian law. You support Indian law, I'm all for it. So super simple, just supporting the Constitution. Yeah. You know, we also had a video that we didn't get to a little bit earlier, and it's from an indigenous journalist, uh, Scott Moya, who uh, tweets as, I am not a mascot, which hmm. is very amusing. Let's go to Scott, uh, let's go to Simon, pardon me, Simon Moya. Dear Russell, my name is Simon Moya Smith. I'm Oglala Lakota, and I have a question for you. Today's Thanksgiving. What would you hope the youth of this generation would do to protest this colonial holiday? Thank you. You said you're done with protesting. So right. you, you, you'd said you're done with protesting. Yeah. What do you advise others to do? Well, my advice to the young people is not only to find the truth about their history, but the entire history of the American continent the Western Hemisphere, that requires, that requires some dedication. After finding that out, then your only recourse is to champion freedom and independence. Every human being has a right to be free. And collectively, we Indian people have the right to be free, but not within the European version but through our own. We have the answer through our clan systems and through our matriarchy. And in fact, we have the answer for the world, which is matriarchy. Hmm. But then you have to understand where you come from. Interesting that Simon's, uh, was it his tag, says I'm not a... Yeah, I am I, not a mascot, I'm not a mascot. Right? I, I've called this up here. There's a, there's a cartoon just doing the rounds on the internet. Can you imagine... Uh, the Cleveland Asians, the Cleveland Hispanics, the Cleveland Africans, of course, referring to the Cleveland Indians, which you know, people don't have any problem with. It's become so embedded in, in the cultural and sporting discourse. Do you have hang-ups about these cultural depictions of American Indians? I started that. I sued in 1969. I sued the Cleveland Indians baseball team. Hmm. And... Uh, on behalf of the Cleveland American Indian Center and started that whole ball rolling. So, uh, yeah, I find it very extremely offensive. And the denigration of my people knows no bounds. Hmm. It, it never stops. It stopped for blacks because they did something about it. We try to do something about it, but we don't have... You know the sports fan is about as fanatic as the Nazis. You can't touch their sports teams, man. They go, they go insane. Yeah. Insane. Well, Orwell said, you know, competitive sport is war minus, minus the shooting. Yeah. So exactly. You know, they're, they're the ones who, who... These sports fans are the exact corollary with the ones who rooted for the lions to eat the Christians. And, and what about those cultural depictions on, on other levels? For example, in the schools where, um, you know, Chris Rock uh, made the joke saying that every time they want to do the Thanksgiving scene, uh, you know, for the, for, for the primary school kids or the kindergarten kids, they find some Puerto Rican kids and they stick feathers in their hair and they go, that's not, you know, he says, that's not Pocahontas, that's Jennifer Lopez, you know, um, implying that even when 
even when there's attempted sincerity in, in depicting American Indians in a good light, uh, Hispanics usually play the role of American Indians. How deeply embedded is all of this in, in the psyche of American society? And do, um, I mean, do you have any hope that this will change given that it seems to be perpetuated on, on a day-to-day -day basis? Actually, I, it, it is a lot different today than it was 30, 40 years ago when I initiated that lawsuit, okay? We just won a major victory in North Dakota, forcing the University of North Dakota to change its, its uh, athletic team name from the Fighting Sioux to something else. NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, has outlawed any, uh, any athletic team names that refer to uh, ethnic groups. So we're winning, slow but sure. But we're losing, slow but sure. Matoya? Hmm. Right. And why do you think people are so willing to hang on to these types of names? So we have another tweet uh, from Cheryl Head who asks, what does Mr. Means think of sports teams like Washington Redskins using names that are offensive to Native Americans. And you know, this has been an ongoing debate. I grew up here. And I remember reading all the newspaper editorials about it when people would sue. Um, I think sports columnist Tony Kornheiser made a joke. He's like, if we want to keep the name so bad, we should just change our mascot to a potato. And then it makes more sense. Um, but at the same time, the fact that this racial slur is continuing uh, is you know, disturbing on a lot of levels. What do you think about that? And why do you think people are so complacent? They're so complacent because they're ignorant. And racism comes from ignorance. And so the bedrock question is, why is this racism allowed to be perpetuated? It should, be, it should have taken place in nipping it in the bud at the grade school level back in the 1970s when we first brought it up and had all the movements with us and the notoriety with us. Why wasn't it changed then? No, it wasn't changed because the federal government has control of the school system. In a departure from the discussion as we wrap up, on, on a personal note, I understand that you're fighting cancer very well, very hard, and that you're winning. Right. There's two reasons why I'm winning against cancer. I, you know, I was given the death sentence. I, I should be dead by now, according to the experts. Uh, I was diagnosed on July 18th. I was given a couple months to live. But I use Indian medicine and prayer from all over the world. I got prayers from all over the world, from every discipline, from Hindus, from Muslims, from Jews, Christians, you name it. I've got, I've got Hindus, Sikhs. I got prayers from Buddhists, atheists, agnostics. Now, they didn't pray, but they wished me well. You know? So it's, I know prayer works, and uh, I'm living proof. Well, we wish you strength and we thank you very much for taking the time uh, despite uh, personal tragedy in your family, despite your illness as well, which you're fighting very strongly. Uh, despite all of that, you came and joined us on the Orange Couch. We're very appreciative and uh, we thank you for your pearls of wisdom. Thank you. Well, there you have it, Russell Means there. Latoya, thanks for joining us. Are you back on Monday as well? I am back on Monday. I'm in uh, Russell's spot as a guest on the couch and we're going to talk about internet privacy and yep. law. Yeah, you'll be, you'll be with uh, Derek Ashong on Monday. So I hope you look forward to that. Stream.aljazeera.com. As always, you can watch a rerun of the show in a couple of hours time or so when it will be reposted. Thanks for watching. See you next time.